Praise the Lord. Welcome everyone to the Apostolic Church in Whitesboro. We are so thankful to be gathered in the name of Jesus and to be covered by his precious blood and just blessed to be his servants. Amen. And we have come to worship him and to exalt that name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. One day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Above 
him there's no other Jesus is the way hallelujah you are the way the truth and the life all men must come to you Lord for you are the life that we seek and need so desperately in this world that we live in thank you for your grace your help hallelujah your compassion for your creation I'm pressing on the upward way new heights I'm gaining every day still praying as I'm onward bound Lord plant my feet on high that is ours today, Jesus, through your precious blood. Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands and thank him for being so good to us. Father, you are good to us. We love you and rejoice in you. Hallelujah. You have given liberally and we are rich today because of that giving. Amen. God has so much in store for us. Praise God. There's so much more he will reveal. He wants to reveal. Amen. He has a tendency to save the best for last. 
And uh, I'm not even sure if you can use that analogy with him because he's going to live forever. Amen. So uh, I just know, like one old boy said, it's going to get gooder and gooder. <laughs> Amen. It's just going to get gooder and gooder. It's going to be better. Praise God. God has so much in store. And I do know this, that this life that you and I live, even though it may not be easy, easy it is our portal, our, our place where we enter into his presence and we form an incredible bond with him. And that's going to carry on with us throughout eternity. And so I encourage you, get a hold of his nail-scarred hand and don't let go. Let God give you strength on this journey. Trust in his word. Remain faithful to what he has called us to. And he will do a great work through you. Amen. And sometimes in spite of us. <laughs> Amen. Because sometimes we're doing our best and bless, bless our hearts. It's, yeah. And, uh, but God works through it in spite of all that. Praise the Lord. And so today, if I can, through the word of the Lord, I want to increase your faith and encourage you in your journey. <clears throat> we live in the best of times. We, we see more than many of the prophets of God have been able to see. Because we can look back and look at history and see what God did. And we can go, oh, that's what they were talking about. Oh, that's what they meant by that. And so at this point, we know we are living in not the, not the end times, but the end of a time, a time period. Amen. And we know that it's not very far, and Jesus is going to come back and set up his kingdom on this planet. And so we are in a very glorious place. We know that all the world's attention is focused on Jerusalem for a reason. Amen. Because he's coming back to Jerusalem. He's coming back through the Eastern Gate. You know, they sealed the Eastern Gate up years ago thinking that they'd stop him from coming back. <laughs> Bless their hearts. <laughs> Bless their little hearts. You know, they just don't grasp it. They don't realize it. Amen. And it's like the, the, the uh, I think it was Nicodemus in the, in the Sanhedrin. He told him, he said, uh, let's pre-adventure we find ourselves to fight against God. You know? I mean, that's, that's, that's so petty. That's so petty. But guess what? God's going to do all right. He's fine. He, he is not struggling at all. And uh, the devil is, he's sweating bullets right now because he knows his time is short. The scripture tells us he has great wrath. He's very angry because of it. And, uh, and that's just tough. You know, that, that's just too bad. Amen. But for the church, for the people of God, wow, we're in an incredible place and privileged to be able to call upon his name. Do you ever feel like that you need your faith increased? Yeah. You know, sometimes we, I believe, Lord, you know, but like the one father said, help my unbelief. <laughs> Amen. I know you got this, but wow, am I ever struggling with it? And, uh, and so Luke chapter 17 and verse 5 is where we're going to open up. You can remain there because we will read a little bit more of that chapter setting. But in Luke 17 and verse 5, we're going to, uh, we're going to let that, that man's uh, request uh, kick this off as we go into his word. Oh, this is the apostles that requested this. I'm sorry, I'm getting, getting myself ahead of myself. In uh, Luke 17 and verse 5, it says, And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. Amen. Uh, God has called us to a place of serving. We walk by faith and not by sight. Can somebody say amen? amen. I thank you for standing in honor of the word of the Lord. The, the power of God's word will redeem us, it will strengthen us, it will keep us, and it will help us to overcome. And so faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. We read his word, we know his promises, but yet we're like, how can you possibly bring this to pass, God? And so in Luke 17 and 5, the disciples or apostles ask him, saying, Lord, increase our faith. 
Amen. We need our faith increased. And let that be our prayer today. Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your anointing and your presence, God. And thank you for the faith to be here this morning. You've given us faith. We all have a gift of faith. And so, Lord, I pray that that gift will be increased through the word of the Lord, the anointing power of the Holy Ghost, and our obedience in Jesus' name. The church said amen. 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 You may be seated. God bless you. It is a struggle that we've always fought with. Uh, in the beginning of Luke 17 and 1, <clears throat> Jesus spoke to his disciples and shared a thought with them. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but offenses must come. But woe unto him through whom they come. So he's letting you know you're going to be offended. We taught just a few weeks ago about the house built on the sand and the house built upon the rock. And the one thing that was evident with both houses is they're going to go through storms. You're going to go through some storms. I'm going to go through some storms. And it's very vital that we have our roots on the rock of faith of Jesus Christ. And he says it's impossible, but offenses are going to come. You're going to be offended. But he says, try to make sure you're not the one who is doing the offending. Verse 2, it said, if it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea, then he should offend one of these little ones. And he's talking about his children. He's talking about you and I. Anyone who offends us, anyone who intentionally causes us distress and trouble, God's going to get them. And I've been telling you this for a long time. When Jesus said to pray for your enemies, I believe it's because you may be the only one praying for them. And if God punishes them according to what they have done to you, they're going to be in big trouble. And so it would behoove us to pray for them because we don't want that to befall them. But judgment will come. God is just. He will judge those that uh, have been wicked and those that have done unrighteousness. He says in verse 2 there, he said, it's better for him that a millstone was hanged about his neck and he was cast into the sea. It'd be, a, it'd be better just to die than it would be to offend one of God's children. Verse 3, take heed to yourselves if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, bring it to his attention. If he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, I'm sorry, thou shalt forgive him. I don't know about you, but I kind of like this. Now, you may not want to forgive somebody that offends you seven times in a day if they ask you for forgiveness but God wouldn't ask me to do something he won't do. And there's many days we go through and more than seven times we're saying, oh Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me for doing that. Forgive me for saying that. Forgive me for thinking that. Amen? Thinking an amen, you know? And, and so this is a reality. And so when we take the word of God, we begin to realize how good it is for us, what he is telling us to do. He's already doing it. So that ought to give you some encouragement, praise God. But it also lets us know, and, and here we're talking about increasing our faith. He didn't say, forgive them if they don't repent. He said, forgive them if they repent, if they ask to be forgiven, forgive them. Now, I believe we should forgive them because the scripture does tell us to forgive our debts, our debtors, and so on, you know. Uh, that was a prayer, uh, but we are to forgive them. But the importance of requesting forgiveness, I believe that you and I, one of the greatest gifts that God has given to us, and think about this for just a second, is that we could remain a repentant soul before his throne, completely surrendered, completely yielded. Not perfect. That is not perfect. Repentance means we're not perfect. <laughs> I mean, I haven't got it all together. I'm not doing it all right. I don't have it all figured out. I'm not making all <clears throat> the best choices. I'm not crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's. I wish I were, so do you. But if we're obedient and we repent, because he said if we don't, we'll perish. Amen? So consequently, you and I, if we are obedient to him, and this is where our faith has to be increased, 
because we realize repentance is valuable to us and we're proud people. Well, you just try to get your teenager to repent. I beg to differ. It's, it's going to be a struggle. Say you're sorry. It can be a five-year-old. Say you're sorry. Uh-uh, they ain't doing it. Okay, why? Because we're stubborn. Repentance means we have to surrender. And we have to submit. And that takes faith. Because we don't want to do it. <laughs> not my fault. Surely it's not my fault. I surely didn't do that. That's not my fault. Huh? Even though when they bring it up to us, you know, we get all mad about it. But the truth is, well, okay, well, I did it. <laughs> we have to admit it. All right. So repentance is an incredible gift that is given to us. And he says that if your brother or your sister trespass against you seven times in a day and says, forgive me, forgive them. And this is where the apostle spoke up and said, Lord, increase our faith. I don't think I can do that. I don't think I can do that, Lord. If, if my brother offends me seven times in a day and says, forgive me, I have to forgive him? Come on. He's a mess. All right. He goes on in verse 6. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But which of you having a servant? Well, before we go into that, that illustration, the sycamine tree, and I, I, I shared this with my father-in-law some time back, and it's incredible. The sycamine tree, <clears throat> the roots grow incredibly deep. And they are incredibly resilient. Um, they are also, if you taste the, their, their, their pitch, they're very, 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 very bitter. Very bitter. And... The sycamine tree was actually used to make caskets out of because it doesn't rot. It just it just lasts and lasts and lasts, even if it's buried in the ground in bad environments. It just lasts. It's, it's hard to get rid of sycamine wood, sycamine trees. Trying to kill them, you can cut them off, you can burn them. They come back again. And this is in relation to bitterness. All right, we get bitter, we get hurt. Remember, he just said, if my brother offend me, what happens when somebody offends you? You get bitter, you get mad. You get hurt. You want to carry that around. You want to nurse that. It turns into a grudge, it turns into hate. And then pretty soon you're mad at them and they don't even know it. You got ulcers and they don't even know it. Amen. It's crazy. But he says the sycamine tree is very bitter but it's very hard, very, very hard to get rid of. And the roots go down deep. But he said, if you got just a little bit of faith and you say to that sycamine tree to be plucked up by the roots and cast into the sea, you know what happened if you put a sycamine tree in salt water? It's going to die. That's one of the hardest trees to kill. But if you got faith, you can kill it. Bitterness is one of the hardest things to get out of your heart and out of your life. It, it grows roots down into all your being. It takes you over. And somehow, through faith, they said increase our faith. You want more faith? You're going to have to pray for the sycamine trees to be plucked up and pulled out of your life. The things that have made you bitter, the things that have taken root, that cannot die, that cannot, they, they are, they're there, it seems to stay. He goes on verse 7, But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, By and by, when he has come from the field, Go sit down to meat. In other words, go take care of yourself. And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Because that's their job. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? He said, I trow not. He said, you ain't going to do that. That's his job. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded of you. Remember we talk about obeying God, obeying the, the word of God, obeying the gospel. Okay? He says, when you have done everything that is commanded of you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. We have the awesome opportunity to remain humble before God. And we can get pretty high-minded. We can get pretty 
strong in our thinking, but we need to humble ourselves. Realize God's got all this. We need to do our best. And that doesn't make me better than you. It doesn't make you better than anybody else. We're just doing our job. Amen. We can stay humble in this. And through these things that Jesus is teaching his disciples, this will increase our faith. Amen. When we are repentant, when we are forgiving, amen, and when we are humble. These are factors in our lives. And, and they're keys that not very many people are going to get out of the scriptures. But it is the essence of our walk with God. It is the very essence of it. Amen. When we are humble and we are repentant, we are willing to submit to whatever God wants us to do and to, to ask forgiveness when we fall short and so on, then God can do so much through us. And if we can forgive others, he said that if you will forgive, you will be forgiven, right? He said, if you'll have mercy, you'll obtain mercy. That's how this works in his kingdom. That's a commandment. That's a rule. But yet there are a lot of Christians who say, we don't have to do anything. All we got to do is just believe Jesus died for us on Calvary and we're good. I think there's a little more than that. And so it may be possible they need their faith increased. And that's what happened here with the disciples. In in the scriptures, there are so many wonderful things that God has done to help us. In uh, Mark chapter 9, and verse 17, this is the Father's plea for help to increase his faith. And I bring these up because we struggle sometimes in our faith, trusting God that it's all going to be good. Mark, seven, <clears throat> Mark 9 and verse 17 it says, And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit, which means I cannot speak. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And now this is interesting because Jesus gets frustrated with us, <laughs> his disciples. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. He fell on the ground and wallowed and foaming. And he asked the father, How long is it ago since this came on him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Can you believe, church? Can we believe for the needs and the things that we see around us? Okay, this is a challenge. There are, there are loved ones that you're trying to believe God for. There are miracles you're trying to believe God for. There are circumstances and situations we're trying to believe God for. Can we believe him for it? He said, all things are possible if you can believe. Verse 24, and straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. The spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead and as much as many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? He said unto them, This kind comes not forth but by prayer and fasting. You want to increase your faith? Pray and fast. Spend some time with the Lord. Amen. Uh, this man knew, I know you want me to believe Jesus, but I'm going to need some help here. <laughs> Because you see, this has been a problem since this child was born. And everything we have attempted to do to deliver him from this affliction has failed, including your disciples praying for him. I want to believe, but I need help. And that's okay. We don't see Jesus saying, oh my goodness, you're pitiful. I'm so thankful that the Lord does not rebuke us for our struggles. Amen. 
We need to try. There's an interesting statement that I've heard from a guy say that you cannot hit a home run if you don't swing the bat. If you don't try, you ain't getting nothing. And sometimes because of our struggles, we quit trying. There are many people that have given up on life at the very point where they could have turned around and gone the other way. I listened to a testimony that Steve Harvey, he's a comedian, I don't know much about him, but he did share a testimony of how as a young man, he had got down to the point where he was almost destitute. He was in a parking lot in his car. He was living out of his car. He had $35 to his name. And uh, he was trying to be a comedian, and it wasn't paying. <laughs> it wasn't working. And, uh, and I believe he obviously, from the way he spoke, he obviously has a religious background. In other words, he's lived for God. And in the process of this, he's asking God for help because he's at the end of his rope. He can't take any more. And the Lord opened up a door. He actually had broke down and was going to call his dad and go back home and just give up. He tried. It failed. It didn't work. And when he called home, he accidentally dialed. He has the, back then they had the answering machines. You could dial in your number and you could get the messages off of it. And he accidentally got the answering machine, and so he dialed in his, his uh, little code. And a uh, promoter had called, wanting him to come to New York and do see if he could fill in a spot there. Well, the only problem was is he was, I don't know, down in Georgia or something, and he had $35 to his name, and he couldn't hardly get out of town, let alone get to New York for this, for this deal. And he's like, oh, that's great. I can't do that. And, uh, and I guess somehow he contacted he. Called back and checked a little bit later, tried to call back, and uh, lo and behold, there was another message that came in right after that, and it was from a prom promoter down in Orlando, Florida, I think, and he said, if you can get down here, I've got a spot for you. And so he was able to get down there for that spot, did so well that he got two nights out of it instead of one, got $300, was able to get a plane ticket that flew him up to New York, and was able to catch the other gig. And that was a turning point in his career and in his life. But he was at the point of giving up and quitting. All right? And so many people in life get to that point where they just want to quit. They want to throw up their hands. I, I, you know, I used to believe. I'd like to believe. But I can't. I need help believing. The important part is, is we never give up. Don't give up on your loved ones. Don't give up on your miracles that you're needing God to perform. Don't give up on any circumstance or situation that you find yourselves in. And to do that, you're going to have to increase your faith. Sometimes we have to just physically increase our faith and say, Lord, I'm just going to trust you. We haven't got nothing to base it on. Our feelings and emotions may be drained. We may be, we may be at the end of our rope. But you know what? But God. We're like, okay, God. Don't ever give up on God. You may give up on yourself, but don't ever give up on God because God doesn't give up on us. And the same with our loved ones. And this father, he was at the end of his rope. He didn't know what to do. And Jesus says, you just got to believe. And he's like, you don't understand, man. I, I've, I've tried to believe everything I can believe, and I can't believe no more. I, I can't do anymore. I'm doing all I can do. Amen. And God blessed him. God took care of him. The boy was healed and delivered. And it was a great miracle through faith. And we need that kind of faith. Many have faith, but they need to embrace truth. Uh, lies can really get in the way of our prayers being answered. If we are serving God according to lies and deception, if we've been deceived in the scriptures, if we've been taught wrong in the scriptures, that can really mess our heads up from getting a blessing from the Lord or doing what pleases God. There are some religions that teach that you should... You should beat yourself and mistreat yourself to get favor with God. That's a lie. And that does not get you any closer to God. Okay? But there are deceptions out there that sometimes are put into our heads that can mess with us. And we need just a little bit more truth to increase our faith. We've prayed and prayed and God's not answering. But maybe we're not doing what God wants. What if we're doing it wrong and don't know it? And so we need to search the scriptures because they are our guide. In John chapter 20 and verse 24, Jesus appears to Thomas. Thomas had faith. 
But he needed a little bit more truth. And that's John 20 and verse 24. This is after the crucifixion. Jesus has been buried, died. Thomas is having issues. He doesn't believe that he's resurrected. And so, verse 24, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came and appeared. The other disciples therefore said unto him, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put on my finger, put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. So he shows up in the room, and he didn't come through the doors or windows. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him a very profound statement, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet they believe. Thomas, when he was able to see Jesus for himself, boom, truth stood before him. And that truth gave him the faith that he needed to believe. All right? And sometimes we are lacking truth in our lives and that can hinder us from having the faith we need to trust God. Now that truth may be in the, in the evidence that God is going to see you through this. Sometimes and many have got to the end of their rope and it's the end and they've given up and they just give up on God and give up on life and give up on anything. And then God intervenes and miraculously a door opens and truth is revealed to them that he does still care. They need that truth. They need to know that God has not given up on them. They've given up. They've quit. They want to take their own lives. But then God steps in and God gives them a little bit of truth when they desperately need it to increase their faith so that they can again trust in God. And many times that's the turning point in people's lives. Many Christians today are serving God because God has done just exactly that thing. And it has increased their faith tremendously. Jesus' words to Thomas are, Blessed are your eyes because they've seen the truth and believe. But he says, More blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. We've not seen the physical face of Jesus Christ. But yet we're sitting in church this morning and we're worshiping him and loving him and trusting him. Amen. And we know that he's alive and well and, and doing fine because our faith believes in him. Amen. And that's a great blessing. And God is well pleased with your faith. But this is a, a lesson this morning on how to have more faith, how to increase our faith. Some of the things that increase our faith. Some people don't have any faith, or they don't think they have any faith, until they see a miracle. And then they're like, wow, maybe God is real. And all of a sudden that faith, that gift of faith that's in every person, it increases. And then they begin to pursue. Sister Vani Mount Marshall was a Hindu priestess in India in a family of priests. And uh, she had an illness that she could not get healed of. Could not, the doctors couldn't do anything. They'd done everything they could. She was suffering from it. And she was getting so desperate. And there were over 3,000 gods that they were petitioning. They were petitioning everybody under the sun for healing. For miracles. They were trying to put their faith in everything but Jesus Christ. And she ran across a track. And in that track, it challenged her to give her petition to Jesus. Trust him for it. And so in her desperation in her room one day, she told Jesus, she said, if you'll heal me, I'll serve you. And I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact details, but that's that was the essence of her experience and he did <laughs> he did she had no faith in Jesus up to that point none she couldn't she didn't trust him she didn't know him she matter of fact she was probably against him 
but she had petitioned all of her gods that she could come up with, done everything with the doctors. There was no other outlets, and as a result, she's forced to finally, you know, Jesus is presented to her, and she's like, hey, I've tried everything else. Let's do this. And he healed her. And as a result, God completely turned her life around because now she's in contact with truth, and her faith becomes great. And she begins to influence her family. And then she goes on to get the Holy Ghost and be baptized in Jesus' name. And she has since uh, come to America and been a great force in the, in the gospel and the ministry. She's, she's taught Bible studies in the United Nations. Uh, God has opened up doors for her that are absolutely amazing. But there was a time when she didn't have any faith in Jesus. All she needed was a little truth. She needed a healing. She needed a miracle. She needed God to touch her. This father whose child was tormented by demonic spirits couldn't, couldn't hear and couldn't speak. And uh, he just needed a little help for his faith. He was trying to believe. Amen. And so it is with Jesus. He's incredible. He really is. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We are challenged in our believing and trusting God in the gospel. The gospel is so important that we are obedient to it. It's not just a matter of believing that Jesus existed and died for us. In um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I believe it is, and verse 7. The writer here says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Well, it would seem very apparent to me there that it's absolutely necessary for us to obey the gospel. So what do we obey? There are so many in the Christian ranks to say all you have to do is believe. They don't say anything about obeying. It's believe. Just believe he existed. He died for you and that he loves you no matter what you are and what you're doing. And, and they pretty much let many of them continue on doing what they're doing and, and nothing changes. They believe and count that for obedience. But there's got to be something to do if we're being obedient. And of course, as we just read, part of obedience is, is doing what he told us to do. And that's forgiving others and loving others and, you know. Uh, that's part of obeying. Amen. That's a very critical part of it. In Acts 8 and 12, let's do some quick examples here. The book of Acts is, is loaded with some good examples on this. Acts 8 and 12. Philip is preaching. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Women. Now that's something you could obey. If the preacher told you you need to be baptized, then you can obey that, can't you? That is something that you need to submit to. You need to do. And there were others that were included in this. Um, verse 13, Then Simon himself believed also when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, wondered, beholding the miracles and signs that came along with it. And uh, and. In this situation, Simon, he tries to pay money to barter with them that he can get the power of the Holy Ghost to lay hands on people and they get the Holy Ghost. So that's, that's stirred up a whole other problem. But you see here that they were preached that they need, to be, they need to be baptized in Jesus' name. And there are some Christians today who don't believe baptism is important. They don't believe it's essential to salvation. But it is part of what we must obey. And remember what I'm talking about, our faith to be increased. Maybe we need to just obey the Word of God and do what the Word of God told us to do. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, the first time that the gospel message is ministered in the New Testament. And uh, I read something today that I thought was really good. I've heard for many years, and I've said it many times myself, that the book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles. But really, the book of Acts is the Acts of the Holy Ghost. The apostles are just the vessels. We're just doing what God tells us to do. It's not our Acts. It's God's Acts. He's the one who's doing it. 
And so in, in the book of Acts, the gospel is preached for the first time in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, says, Now when they heard this, they are preached to that they have crucified the Messiah, and they have messed up big time, and they don't know what to do about it. And so they say here, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Okay, well, if you're going to obey, that means that you're going to have to, repentance means you're going to have to turn from your wicked ways. You're going to have to do what God wants you to do. He says, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. So your sins are washed away. So there's something else you can obey and do. All right. And he says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for this promise is unto you, to your children, to all them that are far off and uh even as many as the Lord our God should call, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word, they were willing to obey it, were baptized. All right? How? In the name of Jesus Christ. Not the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And that same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They were baptized in Jesus' name. They were willing to repent or turn from their wicked ways. So, increasing our faith. There's your first step. Amen. Obedience to the gospel. Because in 2 Thessalonians, it said that there are angels in flaming fire that are going to come and take vengeance on those who obey not the gospel. So there's got to be something to obey. Something that you're responsible for in honoring God's word and doing what God wanted you to do or becoming what God wanted you to be. Acts chapter 11 is very awesome because Peter is called back to Jerusalem because he has just gone and preached to Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10, and they are Gentiles. He is a Jew. He's not even supposed to talk to them. And lo and behold, while he's there at Cornelius' house, they get the Holy Ghost. So big uproar when he gets back to Jerusalem and he comes before the council. And in Acts chapter excuse me, 11 and verse 17, he gives his defense. He says, For as much then as God gave them the like gift, the Holy Ghost, as he did unto us with the initial evidence of speaking in the tongues, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? He said, I didn't do this. God did it. The early church had a hard time believing that God would fill the Gentiles with the Holy Ghost. Because they didn't even think they were supposed to be talking to Gentiles. But Peter obeyed. Remember, he's up on the rooftop, gets a vision from God, and... God lets him know, you're going to have to go with these men, and you're going to have to go see what they're up to. And when he gets to Cornelius' household, he perceives, he realizes, wow, God, you're opening this up to more people. You're opening this up to the Gentiles. And as he begins to preach to Cornelius' household, the Holy Ghost comes down. And they begin speaking in other tongues and worshiping God. And then he commands them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, Acts 10, 44, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And then he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, if you are commanded to do something, isn't that something that you need to obey? Amen. There's obedience this there. This is why I'm saying that truth can stop us from experiencing what God has for us. We have some dear Christian brethren that that have church and they believe that Jesus is not working miracles anymore. And I'm talking about our local community here. They are Christians. They call themselves Christians. They go to church all the time. But they don't believe in miracles. And you know why? Because they're not getting the Holy Ghost. Because as we'll find out in Acts chapter 19, they don't know that there be any Holy Ghost. They think, they've been taught that that's just for the disciples back in the book of Acts. Let's go there. Acts chapter 19. And verse 2. I'm actually jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but I can't help it. Acts 19 and 2. Paul runs into some disciples of John the Baptist. And he says unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. 
Then he asked them how they were baptized. They said, under John's baptism. And then verse 5 says, when they heard this, they were baptized. How? In the name of Jesus Christ. And then Paul lays hands on them, and they're filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking other tongues, and prophesy as the Spirit gives them utterance. So here, they receive truth, and what happens? Their faith is increased, and they experience miracles in the kingdom of God. And as I said earlier, there are local churches that because they're not getting the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues, yet they believe they've got the Holy Ghost, okay? They've got God's Spirit in them. They're, they don't understand why they're not seeing miracles. And the reason I say this is because I knew one of them. I believe he's gone on to his reward. But he told me, he said that uh, he had a really severe accident and was crippled very badly. And he prayed for God to heal him and God healed him. And he said that uh, I've got people in my church that don't believe in miracles. But he said, I am one. Okay? Can you see how the lack of truth can hinder your faith? It's hard for you to have faith when you don't know what you're supposed to believe in or do. We wouldn't be here if we didn't have faith. We wouldn't be here if we didn't have faith. God's given to all of us faith. But it's very vital that we have truth to put our faith in. Because if your faith is being placed in lies, Sister Bonnie Marshall's faith was being placed in all the Hindu gods. And it was not doing her a bit of good. Because that, was, that wasn't truth. That was a deception. They were not real. But Jesus Christ is the true and living God. And when you put your faith in Him and in His Word and you are obedient to it, you get results. Being baptized in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is not going to do much for someone except get them wet. But if they're baptized in Jesus' name, as we are taught through the scriptures, then the blood of Jesus is applied to our sins and there is remission or forgiveness of sins. And when we stand before the judgment seat of God and the books are opened, there's going to be no sins because they've been buried in the precious name of Jesus, when the blood was applied. But there are many that I fear that have been baptized in the titles, Father, a Son, and Holy Ghost. There is no name, there is no blood, and there is no remission of sins. They have faith. They were trying to do what they thought God wanted to do because that's what they were told, but it's not what the Scriptures command us. If we're going to obey the gospel, which is obeying what Jesus did, he died, he was buried and resurrected again. We die out to sin and repentance. We're buried with him in baptism. And then how do we arise to walk in a newness of life? Through the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And how did they get the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts? Initially, they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. God proved it. And you talk about increasing your faith. You get filled with the Holy Ghost. You speak in other tongues. You're going to go, whoa, that's God. You have a renewed zeal. You have a faith that so many Christians today struggle with. And they don't know why. And they need their faith increased. They need truth. And the truth will increase their faith. Because like Thomas, they're going to be able to reach out and touch something tangible in God. And God's going to be able to honor it. And they're going to go, wow, yes. Even though they've been taught otherwise. Amen. Amen. Thomas had such a hard time believing that Jesus existed till he touched him. And then as soon as he did, he realized, whoa, you are God. That's the only way that happened. Amen. And so we are blessed that we can take advantage of God's blessings in this. Um, some are going to believe and some aren't. And in the book of Acts, as it finishes up, chapter 28 and verse 24, this is going to be a dilemma that all of us will see in our ministering the word and our obeying the word, Acts 28 and verse 24 <clears throat> says, And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. This will always be a struggle. And if we don't have enough faith to believe the truth. Now, I understand this too. There are many they have tried everything out there, every religion under the sun. And when you and I come to them with this gospel, 
They're so fed up with hearing stuff that they discount what we have to say. And all we can do is pray for them because it's going to take God touching them to open their eyes to realize, whoa, just because you've been searching in all the wrong places doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Okay? Amen. But they can get very frustrated. I believe there are many people who claim to be atheists, not because they don't believe in God, but it's because they don't believe in all the religious garbage that's out there, and they don't want to get involved. And if they're an atheist, then you can't talk to them about it because they don't have to listen to you. And that's kind of the end all for them. But it doesn't change the fact that God's real. Amen. So people are going to be frustrated. Some are going to, some are going to believe and some aren't. And there's not much we can do about that. Paul said this way, not all men have faith. Not everybody has faith. But I do know this, that if you and I pray for them, and God heals them or God delivers them, they're going to have to go, whoa. And tell them that. Say, you know what? I'm going to be praying for you that God heals that or that God fixes that or that God delivers you from that. And they're going, yeah, whatever. Okay? But when God does it and truth sits on their doorstep and they go, wow, that happened. They told me they were, and look what happened. I've been dealing with this all my life. Do you think that father, that his son was delivered from that demonic spirit, became a believer? I don't think he had any struggles whatsoever. It's like the man that was born blind and Jesus healed him. He got kicked out of the synagogue. He didn't care. Man, I am, I'm serving Jesus, man. He's real. This is truth. He healed my eyes. I was blind and I can see now. Sanhedrin and the court wouldn't believe him, would they? Oh, you believe in him, but we don't. He says, wow, this is marvelous. This man has healed someone's eyes who was born blind. This has never been done before. And you can't believe in that? And they're like, what? You were born in sin and here you are trying to teach us? No, he's not teaching them. He's just sharing with them what happened to him. This happened. And you guys are so blind, you will not receive it. So there is a struggle in our world to believe and trust the Lord. Embracing truth. Wow. It's so vital and important that we embrace the truth that God has. And if we will, we're going to be obedient. In Acts chapter 19, we're almost done here. Acts 19 and verse 18. There's great revival, and as a result of this revival, it causes people to confess their sins and to destroy sinful things in their lives. Uh, Acts 19 and verse 18, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. In other words, they repented and said, You know what? I've been doing this, and I've been doing that, and it's wrong. Verse 19 says, Many of them also, which used curious arts, in other words, they were playing with demonic spirits, brought their books together, burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. When we come in contact with truth and we start doing what Jesus told us to do, then you know what happens? Our faith is going to increase and we're going to get rid of things in our lives that are not pleasing to God. You know, that's part of obedience. That's part of repentance. When we realize that I'm doing some things that God don't like, and so you know what? That's got to go. And we just get it out of our lives. We remove it from our lives. By doing that, we open up the doors of faith. And we invite God to pour out blessings in our lives. Because you know what? I'm getting rid of sin, and I need you, Jesus. And he's like, I am so in there. Amen. What an incredible gift we've been given. The Word of God is exciting. In this world, everybody's caught up in 2020 right now. Everything can go wrong. Hey, it's all been doing this. It's all been doing that. You know what? God's doing just fine, church. He's still on the throne. He's in charge of this. As a matter of fact, I've heard some prophecies that he's fixed to unveil all this mess and just let everybody see how messed up things have been. And I'm praying that that brings great revival. Because when they see the truth that they've been believing lies and they've been deceived then they're going to start backing truth, I hope and pray. And as we stand to our feet this morning, hopefully you have enough faith to believe and obey Acts 
2.38. 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, Come out from among them, touch not the unclean thing. And he says, I'll receive you unto myself. In this day and age that we live in, we have a golden opportunity to draw closer to him, to depart from the wickedness of this world, and to enjoy the gift and blessings of faith. Father, we thank you for increasing our faith today, helping us to see where we should place our faith and so that you can do great works in our lives. You cannot bless disobedience. You cannot bless those that do not live in the truth, God, other than you bless us with our light and rain and provision. But Lord, as far as salvation, Lord, we must be obedient to your word. So thank you, God, for revealing these great truths to us today. And I pray this is food for thought that helps someone else on their way. And Lord, we give you praise for your mighty works in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Amen.